Good morning. <clears throat> We're in Yeshaya, <clears throat> Perakhof Aleph. We were looking last week at, in particular, Pasek, um, Pasek Zion. And in particular, we we're looking at page 157 in the Art Scroll, where the Art Scroll quotes the O.L. David on that Pasek. Now this Perik, Perik of Aleph, is a prophecy of Yeshayahu about the downfall of Bovel the Babylonian Empire. And that downfall will occur through Paras Umadai, the Persian Amid, Amid uh, Empire, the Purim Empire, as we, we were familiar with it, Paras Umadai. In the middle of talking about the fall of Bavel, we get a Pasuk or two that seems to be talking about Mashiach, Bias Mashiach. And the question that we raised last week and we said we'd come back to is why in the middle of the prophecy about the downfall of Bavel at the hands of Parasumadai, do we have a psukim or two psukim thrown in here about Mashiach? So the O.L. David, the Pasuk that we're talking about is Pasik uh, Vav and Zion, 6 and 7. If we take a look at page 157 of the Art Scroll, the Pasik says, For thus said Hashem to me, Go station the lookout and let them tell what he sees. He will see a chariot, a pair of horsemen, a donkey chariot, a camel chariot, and he will listen intently with much to hear, and he will call out like a lion. So there are Mepharshim that learn these Psukim, refer to the downfall of Bovel. We mentioned last week, it's Chavakuk. Chavakuk Hanavi, one of the 12 prophets in the book of Trey Asar, was a student, a Talmud of Yeshaya. And he prayed for the downfall of Bovel. And Yeshaya is now prophesizing, at, uh, <clears throat> and Chavakuk is now aware of this, that there will be, in fact, a downfall of Bovel. And we mentioned last week, Aryeh, Lion, which appears in verse 8. Aryeh is the same numerical value as Chavakuk. Okay, so that was one shot. On page 157 in the Art Scroll Commentary, O.L. David suggests that this verse, this verse meaning verse 6 and 7, there's a chariot, there's a pair of horsemen, there's a donkey chariot, there's a camel chariot. What are all these chariots about? And O.L. David suggests that this verse alludes to the combination of circumstances that will herald the coming of Mashiach. The Talmud, Sanhedrin and Sadiq Aleph states that if Israel is not worthy of Mashiach's arrival in a glorious manner, he will be like a poor person riding on a donkey. Our verse, the famous Pasuk, Ani Verochev Alachamo, Mashiach may arrive looking like a poor person riding a donkey. So Gemara says that's how Mashiach will appear in a non-glorious manner if Jews are not roy, they are not uh, worthy of Mashiach appearing in a glorious manner. Our verse speaks of a rider on a camel, which alludes to the descendants of Yishmael. The riders on the chariot alludes to the Roman Empire which the sages describe as the offspring of Esau. According to Chazal, Edom is a descendant of Esau. In fact, Esau who Edom. Esau lived on Harseir. Esau who Edom. We know that uh, he came out. He was red. Alkain Koreshma uh, Edom. There were reasons that he was called Edom. And the Edomite kingdom are descendants of Esau. When the descendants of Yishmoel and Esau unite to persecute Israel, it is a harbinger of the coming of Mashiach. So 
in the middle of the downfall of Babel, we have a prophecy, according to Oil David, <clears throat> of the possibility that Mashiach may have to come on a donkey chariot. In other words, the Navi sees a camel chariot, which are the uh, B'nai Yishmael, the Arabs. He sees a chariot with riders, which are Edom, and Edom and Yishmael bring their chariots together and they, they, they attack uh, and oppress the Bnei Yisrael. And through that, we uh, have the appearance of a donkey chariot. If the Jewish people are not worthy of having Mashiach come in a glorious way, then the Mashiach would come through less than a glorious way or the beginning of Mashiach appearance would come in a non-glorious way. Throughout history, so first let's address what's this doing in the middle of the fall of Bava. As you recall, we learned at the end of Sefer Malachim. There's a Pasuk, it's in Yeshaya, we learned the Pasuk, you go back to Yeshaya, <clears throat> Go back to Shaya, the end of Perak Yud, <clears throat> Perak Yud Aleph, where we have the Haftorah that in Chutzlaretz they say on the the. Uh, Shmini Shal Pesach, the last day of Pesach. It's after we don't say here in Eretz Yisrael because we don't have an eighth day Pesach. And it's it, it's talking about the fall of Sancheirah and his 186,000 troops that died, 186,000, 185,000, I don't recall the exact number, that died that night of Pesach when, the Rebona, when they're besieging Jerusalem and the Rebona Shalom opens their ears, and they hear the Malachim saying Shir, and they all die that night. <clears throat> and that's the end of Perek Yud Yeshaya, Od Hayom Benov Lamot. And then Perek Yud Aleph begins, V'yatsa Chotem Igeze Yishai. A staff will grow from the stump of Yishai, and it's talking about Mashiach. V'nachal of Ruach Hashem, Ruach Achmobina, Ruach Eitzav Ruach, Ruach Das Yus Hashem, Barich of Yus Hashem, Lo Lamare Ein of Yishpoi, Lo Mishma Ozn of Yechia. It's a it's a a prophecy about Mashiach. At the end of Sefer Malachim, <coughs> there was a pasuk that we talked about, Lamarbe Hamisra, Marbe is spelled with a mem, marbe. But the way um, we use a mem is if the mem appears if, uh, in the middle of a word, it's a mem patuach. If the mem uh, appears at the end of a word, it's a mem satum. So for example, the word yamim, days. Yamim has a mem in the middle and a mem at the end. The mem in the middle of the word is a mem patuach. The mem at the end of the word is a mem satum. The posik lemarbe hamisra, which is talking about chiskiyo hamelach, the great tzaddik. Lemarbe, the mem, which should be patuach, is spelled with a satum or, or a uh, mem sofit. It's closed. Lemar be, lamed mem, that mem should be an open mem, instead it's a closed mem. The Gemara tells us in Sanhedrin that Chizkiyohu was worthy of being Mashiach, and Sancheirev's siege, siege around Yerushalayim could have been that ultimate war of Gog u Magog, but we were not zochet to have that play out that way, and the Gemara tells us why. The Gemara says that Yechizkiyahu, after he woke up in the morning, the next morning, and he realized that the entire Assyrian army had died during the night, 
he didn't say Shira. And because he didn't say Shira, Takadush Baruch Hu, for that miracle, that, the, that story, quote unquote, that, a bit, that um, the play out of that event, that Chizkiyo would wake up that morning, had he gotten up and sang Shira, Takadush Baruch Hu, he could have been Mashiach. And that war that night, the death of those soldiers could have been Gogo Mogo. He didn't say the Shira, and therefore the window closed. So therefore, when the Pasik describes the sovereignty of Chizkiyo, the Marbe HaMisra, Misra, the Sar, the, the uh, sovereignty, the immense sovereignty of Chizkiyo, Marbe, instead of having an open mem has a closed mem because the window of opportunity, so to speak, closed on Chizkiyo and he was not permitted to be Mashiach. So we have clearly in our history from Chazal, the name of a person, Chizkiyo, the event, the siege of Yerushalayim that could have been Gogomogo, but it didn't work out that way because Chizkiyo didn't sing Shir. Now, I don't want to go into the history of all the false messiahs. That's a whole different parasha. But well, here we have an absolute statement of Chazal that there was a person, Chizkiyo, and Levent, the siege of Yushalayim by the Assyrians, that put all the pieces in place for Mashiach to come. It didn't happen. So here, in the Navuas of the downfall of different um, kingdoms, which we learned about, we learned about the Masa, different Prokim have started with the word Masa, the burdensome Navua, the Navua of the downfall of a kingdom. We've gone through the downfall of the Assyrians. We've gone through the downfall now in the middle of the Babylonians. So as we're talking about the downfall of all these kingdoms, and since we especially spoke about Hiskiyo and Assyria over the last few weeks, so Chas V'Sholem, one may think that the same way the Babylonians fell never to come back, the Assyrians fell off the world stage never to come back. Perhaps, Chas V'Sholem, Chizkiyahu was the last attempt at bringing Mashiach and Gog Umogog, and there is no Mashiach. Now, I'm being very careful with what I say because, in fact, there's a sheet in the Gemara in Sanhedrin, which we're not going to discuss, but there's a sheet in the Gemara that says, A Mashiach Li Yisrael. There is no Mashiach coming for Klal Yisrael. What exactly that means we don't hold like that sheet, but there is such a sheet in the Gemara. We, it's important to understand what it means, but not today. But Chas V'Shalom, when we read about the downfall of all these kingdoms who will never arise again, we learned about the downfall of the Egyptian kingdom, the Kush kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom, the Assyrian kingdom. One can put into there the Jewish kingdom. The Jewish kingdom fell. And it even had an opportunity for Chizkiyo to be Mashiach. And that didn't work out. Perhaps Chas V'Sholem, that's it. There is no Mashiach coming. So here the Navi tells us that one way or another, there is going to be Mashiach Yisrael. Even if the Jews are not worthy, Lo Zahu, even if they're not worthy, Mashiach is coming. He may not come in the most glorious way, he may have to come as a Oni Rochev al a poor person riding on a donkey. But you must know and you must believe that every day he's coming. And he may end up coming if that's Chas Rishon Matzev. He will come even if Jews are not worthy. So again, while Yeshaya is prophesizing about the downfall never to arise again as a kingdom, Bavel, Assyria, Mitzrayim, Kush, etc. 
Don't put the Jewish kingdom in that category. It is arising and shall fully arise again with Mashiach Tzidkenu, Meher Yamenu, and even if Asr Shalom, Jews are not worthy, he will appear. And that's the Nevoah we get according to O.L. David in verse 7. In the middle of all this, you need to know we talked about the fall of so many kingdoms. The Jewish kingdom is going to, has arisen and will continue to rise on the world stage. And Mashiach is coming, even if Chas Shalom, we are not worthy of it. I'd like to point out another uh, historical event here. Rav Hutner talked about this. Um, in a mimer, not printed in the Pachad Yitzchak, but he did speak about this. When he was talking about the Holocaust, he made various points. One of the points he made is a very important historical point. Throughout history, in Europe, in the Middle East, there were constant wars. The Christians against the Muslims, and of course the Jews suffered in the middle. The Muslims conquering the Christian, and of course Jews suffered in the middle. And so it went back and forth, uh, specifically Jerusalem was part of a Muslim conquest, then Jerusalem was part of a Crusader conquest, They're the first Crusaders, the second Crusaders, this Muslim uh, crusade, this Muslim crusade, went back and forth as the Muslims and the Christians were fighting over dominion over Europe and uh, the Middle East. The Jews never who were in the middle of all this. And one of the prime areas that they constantly fought over was Yerushalayim. Point. The Muslims and the Christians were always fighting each other for world domination, and the Jews suffered in the middle. Didn't now there are some historians that say Jews fared better when the Muslims ruled than when the Christians ruled. That can be argued, yeah, yeah, nay, nay, whatever it is. But the Muslims and the Christians were always fighting each other for world dominion, and most importantly. They were always fighting about Jerusalem. O.L. David here is making a very important point that Rav Hutner spoke about, that there will come a point, the riders of the camel chariot are B'nai Yishmael. The riders of the chariot that the Pasek speaks about are the descendants of Asa. Edom. The way we look at the Rishonim, etc., looked at Edom. Edom is the saint of Asa, and Edom represents Western civilization, meaning the root of Western civilization came from Rome, um, some to some degree from Greece, but it came from Rome. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at Western civilization coming together with the Arab world. And when the descendants of Yishmoel and Asaph unite to persecute Israel, it is a harbinger of the coming of Mashiach. That's page 157. It is a well-known fact, and I've written spoke about this that the Mufti of Jerusalem met on several occasions with Hitler Yamakshimoy Vizichroy and the Mufti Yamakshimoy Vizichroy. They met on several occasions and they photographed together. The Mufti met with Hitler and persuaded him, or wanted to persuade him, did persuade him, that he needs to come to the Middle East and kill out the Jews that live in that time Palestine. Now, Mufti, Yamachmai uh, Vezichroy, 
started all kinds of havoc here, was responsible for hundreds, if not thousands of Jews being killed. He left behind during his lifetime, then left behind a, um, a uh, Russia of hatred towards Jews, killing Jews. <clears throat> There's a lot about this Mufti. The Mufti worked with Hitler, both through meeting with him and through letters to make sure that Hitler didn't forget that there were Jews in the Middle East, particularly Palestine, that also needed to be part of that final solution. And they worked together. The Mufti created a situation here in Palestine where the Arabs killed Jews. The 1929 massacres, even before Hitler, later massacres. These two worked side by side. Side by side means that they had the same goal in mind to kill Jews. So while until that time, Western civilization was at war, Western civilization, Edom was constantly at war with the Arab world, the Muslim world. Suddenly we have the Edom world, what we call in this case, uh, the Nazis, we call them Amalek. Okay, we call them descendants of Amalek for whatever reason. They're descendants of Amalek, and Amalek is, of course, a descendant of Asa. So we have the descendants of Asa for the first time coming together with the Muslim world with a plan to kill out all Jews. And that's what happened before and during World War II. It happened, there are written communications, there are pictures of the two of them. We have the Muslim world joining the Western world to destroy Chas V'Sholem Klal Yisrael. That's a phenomenon that occurred before, during World War II. So here we're told that when this Pusik that we're looking at, Pasuk Zayim, Per Kafalaf of Yishaya. When the Muslim world joins forces with Western civilization to uh, oppress, kill Jewish people, that's a harbinger of the coming of Mashiach. Having said what the Oel David says, and having quoted Rav Hutner, that this was a phenomenon that the Western world came together with the Muslim world to try to annihilate Judaism. That is a harbinger that Mashiach is coming. And after we've done Nebuch with World War II, not Nebuch, we're done, but Nebuch, World War II, and we're done with the Holocaust, we have the Hakamas Medina, I'm not talking about whether Hakamas Medina is I'm not talking about it politically. We have, as we've read many times, Rav Dessler's explanation on Mikhail Kamocha Nosi of Pesha Lo Lo Ad Apoy. And Rav Friedland, Rav. Dessler explains that the Hakomis Medina, whether it's beginning Mashiach, whether it's Ikvas of the Mashiach, or whatever it is, he says, I don't know exactly what it is, and I can't make a proclamation, but certainly this whole idea that post Holocaust there was a Hakomis Medina is the hand of God there to help the Jewish people, which of course completely contradicts the other folks out there who have their own narrative about the Satan came down on planet Earth and created the Medina Sisro, uh, which we've spoken about. It's, to me, um, off the charts. It absolutely makes no sense. But people that have a narrative, uh, even after 70 years of watching the narrative dissolve, they can't come to terms with the fact that, oops, I made a mistake. So they continue with their narrative. Rav Desla says that the Hakamas Hamadina 
was actually a Yad Hashem, it was Chesed Min Hashemayim, like Hechzik Lahad Apoy. And therefore, we now have in this Pasik that we've been looking at, we have literally something that we are living through. In the middle of all this prophecy of the fall of Egypt, of the fall of Cush, of the fall of Babylon, of the fall of Assyria, we have a Pasik that says that the Jewish kingdom, which has also fallen and could have arisen in the days of Hiskiyo, but it failed. And one Chas V'sholem can think that the Jewish kingdom is off the charts, the same way that the Babylonian, the Kush, the Egyptian, the Assyrian kingdoms are gone. Maybe the Jewish kingdom is gone. Comes Yeshaya in the middle of all this and says, according to Oil David, that there will come a time that the camel chariots, the Arab world, the Muslim world, will join forces with the other chariots, the Asub world, the Western civilization, and they will try to annihilate the Jewish people and they shall not succeed. And even if the Jewish people are unworthy, even if the Jewish people are, are unworthy after that event, where Esau and Ishmael joined forces to try to annihilate the Jewish people post-World War II, even if Jewish people are not worthy of the Mashiach coming in the most glorious way, he will still come, even if it means he's coming as a poor man riding a donkey, but he is coming. So if people want to think about the, the, um, the Hakamas Medina, as the beginning sparks of the beginning of Mashiach, Reishis Tzmicha Skula Seinu, if those words hurt you, I apologize. If those words speak to you, that's fine. But if people want to look at the Hakamas Medina as a Reishis Tzmicha Skula Seinu, it's the beginning of the blossoming of Agu'ula post-World War II and the Holocaust, there is certainly, um, a lot of source material for this. And here we have right here in the oil David, the, the, the progression of events. Esau, Yishmol coming together, trying to annihilate the Jewish people, but the Jewish people will not fall off the world stage. They will rise again, unlike the other kingdoms that will not arise again, and we will rise again. And even if they're that post Holocaust, we're not completely worthy of a glorious coming of Mashiach. We will still have a racist Samicha school of Seinu of Ahakamas Medina. And you can look at it if you like as an Ani Rochev al This is not the most glorious way to bring in Mashiach, but nevertheless, this is the way God is bringing in Mashiach. And that would appear to fit in perfectly with the Pasuk and the explanation of Ohel David. Let's take a look now at the end of Perek Chaf Aleph, <clears throat> verse 9. This continues to speak about the downfall of Bavel. Vinezev vorechev ish, tzemet parashim, flipping to page 158. Vayan vayomer, nafla, nafla Bavel, vechol pesileha elohe shibala oretz, Medushosni of Engarni, verse 10. Asher Shamata, Me'es Hashem Tzavoko Selike Yisrael, Higadati Lachem. Let's take a look at the English on page 157. Behold, it is coming a chariot with a man, a, poor, a pair of horsemen, and he explains it has fallen, Bavel has fallen. All the statutes of its gods have been shattered on the ground. It is like grain of the threshing floor for me to thresh. What I have heard from Hashem, God of Israel, I have told you. Okay, that's the end of the Navur, the prophecy of the downfall of Bavu. Well, I'd like to begin today, and obviously we'll have to continue next week, the Pasuk Yud Aleph and Yud Beis. And we're going to spend a bit of time on Yud Aleph and Yud Beis in the ne today, a bit of time, and next week and the weeks following that. Because from these Psukim, 
we're going to get a central feature of the idea of what it means to pray. What does tefillah mean? Why do we daven to Hashem? Hashem, if we stand in front of Hashem, we say, Hashem, Layelenu, I'm sick, please heal me. Rabban Shalom, please heal the Jewish people that are sick. Rabban Shalom, please send Parnassah. The Rabban Shalom, before we pray to him, he knows who needs a refuah and whether they're deserving of it. He knows who needs panasa and whether they're deserving of it. And what exactly is tefillah? Are we trying to change God's mind, chas v'shalom? God has decreed that so-and-so will chas v'shalom die, and we're going to daven and we're going to change God's mind so that the person won't die. So first of all, the Rebbe Shalom knows everybody's needs. So to come to him and say, by the way, you know, I need some panasa, why do you do that for? He knows that. And if you're worthy of the panasa, it's going to come. If you're unworthy of the panas and you pray, does that mean that you change God's mind and now he's going to send you panas? And these are all issues that revolve, central issues that revolve around filler. I'm going to take a look at these psukim today and over the coming weeks, I'm going to talk about what exactly filler means and let's see how it develops from these psukim. So the next two psukim are going to talk about a new masa. Masa means, a again, a burden. And there are 10 words by which a prophet can introduce a prophecy, as we've talked about. One of the words is masa. Masa is a burden. It means that what the Navi is about to tell us is a burdensome, oppressive navua to the nation or the person he's talking about. <clears throat> so Pasig Yud Aleph, Parakaf Aleph, Pasig Yud Aleph, page 158. Masa Duma, a burdensome prophecy concerning Duma. What is Duma? Duma is Asa, Edom. Eli Kore Mi Seir, it calls to me from Seir. That's the Yerusha that Asa was given. Har Seir, for Olam Hashem, Baratzian, Lishpot, is Har Asa, Voice of Hashem, Amlucha. Har Seir is Har Asa. Asa, the Torah says, lived in Seir. Mami Laila, what of the night? Shomer Mami Lel, watchman, what of the night? Ama Shema Osa Voike Vegam Laila, those of you who sing Moitzoi Shabbos, Hamavlo Ben Kodesh Lechol, you're familiar with these words. Ama Shema Osa Voike Vegam Laila, it's part of the song. Let's read the English on page 159. A prophecy concerning Duma. He calls out to me because of Seir. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, so someone is calling out to God, the quote unquote watchman of the Jewish people during the night. Night is a way of, it's a marshal, a remis to Golis, the darkness of Golis, and the light is Geula. So someone is calling out, he calls to me, he calls out me because of Seir. The Jewish people are calling out to God because of the oppression of Seir. Seir is Esav, Esav is Edom, Edom is Rome, and we are in Golis, Romi. So these two psukim refer to the Golis that we're in right now, which we call either Golis Edom or Golis Romi. Rome comes from Edom, Edom comes from Asa. So the Jewish people call out to God because of the oppression of Seder. Watchmen, God gets a new name here, Shomer. Watchmen, what of the night? In other words, how much longer is this Golis going to go on, this nighttime? Watchmen, what of the night? Repeating, how long will this Golis go on? The watchman said, Hashem said, morning is coming, a Geula is coming, but also night. Now that's a difficult phrase. The Jewish people ask God, when is this night going to end? When is the Golis going to end? When is the Golis going to end? 
And God answers, don't worry. Morning is coming. The Geula is coming, but also night. There's also more Geulahs coming. What is HaKadosh Baruch Hu saying to us here? There's a Geula coming and a Geulah is coming. If you seek, then seek, repent, and come. Let's just take a look on page 159 in the art scroll, the introduction to verses to verse 11 and 12. Isaiah return, turns to the Roman exile. Isaiah's prophecy turns to those persecuted and exiled by Edom, the future Roman Empire. And of course, the Roman Empire is the one that destroyed the second base on Migdash, and we are in the Gullus of Rome or Edom. According to Rashi, it refers to Rome's persecution of Israel, and Israel cries to God because of the terrible infliction, the terrible oppression inflicted by Edom throughout the current exile. The people pleads with God and asks, when will the suffering finally end? The Babylonian exile was given a limit of 70 years, but the prophets did not foretell when this exile would end. When the Jewish people went into the Babylonian exile, they knew from the Nevi'im that it would last 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, they were going back to Eretz Yisrael. Only some did. We talked about this many times. And a great, a great majority of the Jews decided that Babel was a better place, even though Ezra and Nehemiah went to Eretz Yisrael to build a <coughs> second base on Mikdash. Unfortunately, a great majority of Jews remained back in Bovel. But the Jewish people knew when they went into Gullah's Bovel that it's going to last 70 years. When we went into Gullah's Edom, after the destruction of the second base of Mikdash, we had no, there were no prophets alive. But we never had a prophecy before that told us how long the exile that we're in right now, which is almost 2,000 years, when it would end. We had no prophecy. So therefore, the Jewish people in these, in these psukim, Yeshaya has prophesied that the Jewish people will shout out to God, Shomer, watchmen of the Jewish people. How much longer will the night last? How much longer will the, la will the night last? And we'll continue with this, these two psukim next week. Where does Tefillah come into here? If you take a look at verse 12, we already mentioned that's a difficult passage. God says, don't worry, day is coming, which is the Geula. But night is also coming, which is a Golas. We don't know what that means. But the passage says, in Tevayun Bayu, Shuvu Esayu. What is the words, in Tevayun Bayu mean? Vayun Bayun, the Gemara in Baba Kama, which we'll deal with next week. And at the bottom of page 159, the art scroll that Gemara is quoted, Tavayun means prayer. The Mikta of Melio, Rebelio Odessa talks about it, and we'll talk about exactly what Tfila is and why Tfila is called Ba'ayu. That word Ba'ayu sounds like Baya. A problem. So we have a word, and it's an Aramaic word, and we'll talk about it next week why this Pasuk is written in Aramaic. If you have problems, pray. Ba'aya means prayer. Ba'ayu means, ba'aya means problem. Ba'ayu means to pray. If you have a problem, pray. And we'll be able to discuss prayer in greater detail and begin to answer the question of what the purpose of prayer is. Can you change chas You can't change God's mind. So if God has already decided upon something, we say, let's say some Tehillim. And what exactly is that Tehillim gonna do? It's gonna change God's mind chas v'shalom. So these are questions that we'll deal with when we get deeper into the idea of, of im tevayun ba'ayu. And it's very, as everybody will appreciate, it's very worthwhile to stop, uh, even if it's two or three weeks. Yeshaya Hanobi raises this question 
what is tefillah by using to vayun vayu. And since we daven three times a day and tefillah occupies such a central place in our lives, we ought to spend a little time concentrating on what exactly tefillah is. We will never continue next week.